I've been reading through that um, secret diary of Adrian Plass and trying to work out how many fruit gums he'd get through every Tuesday night here. He'd probably have to go on a diet, wouldn't he? Alright, okay, grab your Bibles. <laughs> and your fruit gums. Right. Obviously, find James. We're still on chapter one. Let's, let's just pray before we start. Father, <clears throat> we thank you for your word. And Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit, who is the bringer of truth, the revealer of truth. Lord, the Spirit of truth himself. And Lord, we just ask him to open our eyes. Lord, that we might see more of Jesus tonight. Lord, come closer to him. Lord, find out more of how we follow you truly and faithfully. Our oh, Father, just work in us tonight, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. Of course, just a reminder that I'm back on my trusty old RSV for this series, although I do promise I shall return to the NIV um, <clears throat> after it. Okay, right. Well, last time we... Um, we saw that the, the reason that James is writing, the, the burden that he had, is purely with what you call ethics. Um, Christian theology, doctrine, all that, is dealt with quite adequately in the rest of the Bible. And James knew full well that the believers were reading the rest of the New Testament and the Old Testament, and he knew that that they were getting all that. But his concern is with Christian behaviour. And the burden behind the book, the, the sentiment uh, that sums it up, the point of him writing, is simply this. He's saying, if you're saved, then act saved. He's assuming his readers are, because he's writing to Christians. And he's saying, if you're saved, then act saved. That is what the letter of James is all about. We saw that it was written very much in the style of the Old Testament wisdom books or literature, you know, Job, some of the Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Um, you know, that that's the style in which he writes and that he's a little bit all over the place. It's not a systematic. Ethics isn't, you know, when you're kind of, you know, like giving instructions for how you actually behave, then it doesn't need to be as systematic as if you're either giving a history, as in the Gospels or the Acts, or if you're kind of, you know, laying out systematic teaching, like most of the other letters um, in the New Testament. So he's very much all over the place, uh, you know, but you've only got to read Proverbs, and Proverbs is all over the place as well, but it doesn't matter because every verse is a gem, and that's the thing that we're going to be seeing with James. Every verse is an absolute gem here. There's, there's treasure um, in each verse. And uh, just, just, just at this point, having uh, got the Law and Grace series behind us, and I mean, one of the things that we, uh, we tackled in that was, uh, you know, the Christians you meet who, who they say, I'm not under law, I'm under grace. And in effect, that's true, but in effect, what they're saying is, I can do what I like. You know, sort of like, you know, they break the speed limit. If you say something to them, oh, I'm not under law, I'm under grace. As if kind of, you know, being under grace means you basically do what you like. Well, you know, sort of James, who certainly understood what grace was all about, he's written a letter here that is broken down into 108 verses. If you read through them and count them up, you'll find 54 commandments. So anyone who thinks that being under grace is you can do what you like is very far off the mark. In, in its 108 verses, this letter contains 54 commands. And that's amazing. I commands authoritative statements of what you're to do. We saw last time, count it all joy when you meet various trials. That's a commandment. That is in the imperative mood. That is you being told to do something. And, uh, of course, because it's in the Word of God, it's as authoritative as if Jesus himself stood amongst us and said, count it all joy when you meet various trials. So uh, there's a lot of commands in this letter, and we're just going to be seeing them, you know, seeing them one after the other. You know, bang, 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 bang. Right, okay, well, last time we did up to um, verse 15, 
And uh, so, so now we'll, um, you know, proceed on to verse 16. Uh, you remember last time when we, um, you know, had a look at a, a couple of the verses, I said we'll be back to them, verse 14 and 15. We will actually be back to them a little bit later on. But just, just for the time being, verse 16. And he simply says this, Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Now, underline that verse in red ink three times in your mind. Because that verse is one of the heartbeats of this letter. All right? It's one of the heartbeats. The danger of deception. That is part of what James is writing about. Do not be deceived. Now, notice in the light of what I've just said that it's a commandment. It's in what is grammatically called the imperative mood. Do not be deceived. The imperative mood. Do this, don't do that. Orders, commandments, authoritative. And here he says, do not be deceived. It's a commandment. We've got to obey this. But remember what we said last time. James isn't concerned with doctrine. So when he says here, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren, he's not saying, don't be deceived about the Trinity. Um, you know, he's not warning about believing wrong things about the Trinity or the danger of denying the Trinity. Um, he's not... He's not warning them not to get deceived over how to organise a church. You know, like, do you have priests or don't you? But, you know, he's not, he's not concerned with that. He's not warning them about getting deceived and, like, thinking you can lose your salvation. Anything like that at all. Remember, James is not concerned with theory. He's not concerning himself with doctrine. So, therefore, when we read this verse here, now, Paul, when he writes, in many places, he warns about the deception, deceiving spirits, false teachers leading you astray. That's all to do with what you believe in your head. But that's not what James is talking about here. That is not the deception he's talking about. The deception he's talking about here is do not be deceived about, and what's the burden of the letter? Our behaviour. That's what he's saying we mustn't end up being deceived about ourselves and about our behaviour. Go to Jeremiah and uh, I think uh, find uh, chapter 17 and we'll find just the verse which I have no doubt at all James was thinking of when he wrote those words. No doubt in my mind at all that he was thinking of Jeremiah. Now find chapter 17 and we're going to read verse 9. When <coughs> Jeremiah writes, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked or corrupt. Who can understand it? Now there, what you've got, the main thing about our hearts, the evil heart of unbelief, as it's called in the New Testament, is that our hearts they're deceitful, they deceive. Now, obviously, if you've got a deceitful heart, you're going to deceive other people. That's part of our sinful nature. But primarily, the thing is that our hearts deceive us about ourselves. That is what James is warning about. We deceive ourselves. Isn't it so easy for us to look at ourselves and to like in our minds we're so ready to declare ourselves innocent concerning that about which we're actually guilty. No, I didn't do that. Knee-jerk reaction. Knee-jerk reaction. We don't want to believe the bad things about ourselves and therefore we end up deceiving others as well. You know, we're sort of like, you know, very ready to often repent of the things we haven't actually done but, but we're not very fast, are we, on repenting of the things we have done. And in fact, very often, we can end up repenting of everything except what God is convicting us of at any one moment. See, we deceive ourselves, and James warns about that. Our self-assessment, we've got to be so careful in it, because if I am the only reference point 
from my assessment of me, then I'm going to be deceived. Because fundamentally, we all think we're wonderful. Even these people who go around saying, oh, I hate myself, I hate myself, they don't hate themselves, they think they're wonderful. And they think that they're so wonderful that they're desperately disappointed that life hasn't come up to the expectations that they've got for someone as wonderful as them. You see, it's because they love themselves. Because, you know, I mean, if you hated you, you know, these people say, oh, I hate myself, I'm ugly. Well, if you hated yourself, you'd be glad you were ugly, wouldn't you? See, you wouldn't be fretting <laughs> about being, oh, I hate myself, I'm fat. But if you hated yourself, you'd kind of, you know, be glad you're fat, aren't you? Because if you hate someone, you want bad things for them. You know, so when, when people go, oh, I hate myself, and then say, for a bad reason, it's a load of rubbish. They love themselves. They just don't think they're getting their due in life. And, you know, we, all the time, our hearts will naturally, at all points, deceive us, okay? And this letter has been written by James to Christians to expose any such deceptions that there are and to show them, and of course us, to show us how we can kind of fight against our hearts deceiving us and how we can truly come to the correct assessment of ourselves that it's vital that we have. So that is one of the heartbeats of this letter. Remember that I said last time that really with chapter one, okay, and we did the first part last time and the second part tonight, chapter one is, is really a bit all over the place and he's introducing the stuff that he's going to go into in more detail later. So really what we're seeing almost is chapter one, think of it as an index, you know, or kind of like the, um, what's it called in a book where you get all the chapters? Yeah. Index, that's right. So he's, he's laying out all the areas that he's going to cover in the rest of the letter. And there is one of its heartbeats. Do not be deceived. And he's talking about our heart, us, deceiving ourselves. Right, now let's just go on to verse 17. He says this. He says, Every good endowment and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Now that's a bit of an odd verse, isn't it? I mean, do you not agree? Or does it seem, no, sort of, you know, seems okay to me. Pardon? It's easier in yours, okay, fine. Um, but let's, let's actually have a look at it. And just bear in mind, at this point, what I, you know, sort of said in, in verse 13 to 15, we'll just go to that now, all, all right? Um, when we saw, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. When sin is full grown, it brings forth death. Now just bear in mind there that you've got the picture of giving birth. Just bear that in mind. We'll be back to it in one moment. Now then, this, this verse, every perfect gift and good endowment, okay, comes from the Father of lights. Now, this thing about good and perfect gift, it doesn't mean perfection in the sense of sinlessness, but it means fully complete or mature. We saw that last time. And so it's talking about that everything that is good, everything that is wholesome in this world, in our experience, ultimately all that comes from God himself. But here he's called the Father of Lights. Okay, now then the lights. To a Jewish writer, the Father of Lights, what's, what's he talking about? What he's talking about with lights, it's the sun and the moon and the stars. That's what James is talking about here. The universe, the heavens above him. And what he's saying here in this verse, because he goes on to say that there is no variation or shadow due to change. Now, what he's saying is God has created the stars, the planets, everything, and he upholds them. He's the creator of them and he holds the universe together. All right? So you look up into the night sky, you've got all those lights up there, God created them. 
But the thing is that they're constantly changing their position. They're in different places at different times. They're always changing. And also, they create shadows. I mean, the sun during the day, it creates shadows. A full moon can do the same on a very light night. So he's talking about the fact that God has created the sun and the moon and the stars, but they keep changing. And because they keep changing, they make shadows, all right. But what he's therefore saying is that God, although he's made them, he's quite unlike them. That God isn't in fact like them because he never changes. So when he says the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change, the variation or shadow due to change is referring to the changing patterns of the stars and the fact that the sun is always in a different place, as it were. One minute it's there, then it's moved over and you see the shadows move. What he's saying is that God isn't like that. He created them, but that's not what he's like. He is unchanging. That God never, ever changes. The technical term is immutable. God is immutable. There is never anything different about him. He is unchangingly good. He is unchangingly holy. He is unchangingly just. He is unchangingly righteous, etc., etc. In fact, he is the exact opposite to us. Because we, left to our own selves, are unchangingly sinful. All right. So then, there, he introduces the idea God never ever changes. He is always the same. Now we go on into verse 18. And he says, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Now, let's, let's go through that because we've got, you know, his own will he brought us forth and by the word of truth and that we should be first fruits. So let's, let's break that down, okay. Now then, remember in verse 14 and 15 we have this thing that each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desires. Uh, desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. You've got the picture of birth there. And he returns to that picture now. The picture is pregnancy and birth. And what he's talking about here, now he's talking about the fact that as Christians, we have been born of God. You see that? He brought us forth by the word of truth, of his own will. So, here, he's answering the question, why are we Christians, all right? And he says quite clearly, we are Christians because God willed that we should be. He's saying here that each one of you was brought forth, each one of you was born again of the Holy Spirit because that was God's will. I mean, Emma, was she born of her will? No, she wasn't. Was Samuel? No. You have no say to that extent in your birth. It happens by the will of others. No creature is ever born of his own will. The only um, exception to that was Jesus when he became a man. He was born of his own will. But apart from that, you get no say in your birth. Okay. Now then, therefore, he's saying about we have been brought forth by God. So behind the decision that each one of us made to follow the Lord, and that's a decision that we did make, but behind that decision, was a decision that God made before even time started. Behind my decision to follow Jesus was the Father's deciding that I was going to be his child. But here, the main concern of James is the mechanism of that birth. And he says that we were born again, brought forth by the word of truth. And that's the main point that he's aiming at here. Simply introducing the idea that you were born again, you became a Christian by the word of truth. And remember, in Romans, Paul said that faith comes by hearing, because obviously we're born again, we put our faith in Jesus, and Paul says faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. 
And Jesus himself said, they shall know the truth, and the truth shall make them free. And so what he's doing there is he's reminding them that the way in which we were born again was through the proclaiming of the truth of God's word. It was the word of God, the scripture, it was the word of God that enabled us to come into his kingdom in the first place. And it was that so that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Now, the thing about the word of God here is that we're going to be seeing that the only way we can ensure that we're not deceiving ourselves, because he's warned us against that, he's saying you've got to make sure that you don't deceive, right? You've got to realise that God is unchanging, and so are you, but you are naturally sinful. But you've been born again by the Word of God, and we're going to see that it's the Word of God that is going to enable us to look at ourselves as we really are, and not get deceived by our own hearts. And that is why he's introducing there this idea of the Word of God. All right, and he talks about first fruits. All right, we've been born again, and he says to be a kind of first fruits. So we've got to understand that. Okay, now there are three ways in the Bible in which this word first fruits is used, and it's only by going through them that we're going to be able to see, in fact, what um, James is actually meaning here. Now, first of all, if you go to Romans 8, we'll see one passage with uh, this word first fruits and see if it's that one. <clears throat> Romans chapter 8. And if you find verse 23. Romans chapter 8 and verse 23. <clears throat> and uh, no, we'll, we'll start reading from verse 22 when Paul says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning in travail together until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we await for adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. Now, this phrase, first fruits there, what Paul is saying is that because we've got the Holy Spirit inside of us, therefore, that's like a down payment on what we're going to get in full. So here, he's saying the life of Jesus is there inside of us, but one day we're going to end up completely glorified like Jesus, as is the whole universe. And it hasn't happened yet, it's going to happen in the future but we've got the Holy Spirit now as a kind of a down payment, all right? We've got the Holy Spirit now as a first fruits. So there's the word first fruits. That isn't what James is referring to, so eliminate that one, all right? Now go to 1 Corinthians 15, and we'll see Paul using this phrase first fruits in a different way, yet again. And uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, um, Let's just read verse 20. And he says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now here, this word first fruits is used of Jesus being raised from the dead. And there it's referring to the fact that because he did, he is the first of many because ultimately all believers and unbelievers are going to be raised from the dead. So there it's saying of Jesus that he was the first to be raised from the dead and glorified. Everyone else is going to follow later, therefore Jesus is the first fruits. The first example of something that's going to come later. You know, and this whole thing about first fruits, it's the first of a batch, the first appearance of a batch of something. That isn't what James is talking about either. It's nothing to do with being raised from the dead. Now then, in Romans 16, don't turn to it, and 1 Corinthians 16, you'll find the only other use of this word first fruits in the Bible is that um, Paul 
uh, would use it of the first people to get converted in a particular area. So, you know, if he went to Asia to preach the gospel or something like that, the first converts in various places he referred to as first fruits. So, you know, evangelists, they broke new ground and people got converted. The first batch of converts they referred to as being the, um, the first fruits. Now, those are the other ways in which the New Testament uses this phrase, first fruits. And so we've got to say, right, okay, now of them, is it any of them that James is talking about? And uh, I've come to the conclusion that the answer is no, because absolutely none of them fit, do they? And the fact that he says that we should be a kind of first fruits, all right, a kind of, um, it suggests to me that he's, he's using this term in a very, very loose and general way, not the specific way that it's used elsewhere in the Bible. And uh, I think that he's simply referring there to the fact that all the Christians at this time were simply the first batch right at the beginning of church history. That obviously he knew that generations were yet to be born and people from them would get saved, but they're like the first, you know, sort of, you know, order of believers, you know, so the first 50 years or so of church life. And I think that's, that's kind of why it is he's using the word first fruits there. But obviously we had to go through the other technical, you know, sort of thing to find out what he was talking about. But what I want to do is just to sum up verses 16 to 18 now, because again, as we go through it, it seems very bitter. You know, we're not reading it in Greek and we're not Jewish like he was. So we've got to put together, it seems to us, all very all over the place, but, you know, sort of basically what James is saying in those, you know, sort of bits there is this. He's saying, as sinners, we produce, we give birth to sin and evil. That's what we do, because you reproduce after your kind. So we are sinners and we give birth to sin, all right? That is us left to ourselves. But if you introduce the Lord into your life, all right, because we're born again, we're born of God, if we introduce the Lord into our lives, then he produces, gives birth to his nature in us. So can you see the idea here? He's saying we of ourselves give birth to sin. But because we are born of God, because we have that new nature, therefore the Lord can produce or give birth to holiness in our lives rather than the sin that our old nature gives. All right. And the Lord never changes. So goodness and holiness is a potential for us. To say we're sinners and that's it, boom, boom, end of story, isn't the truth. We've got a new nature because we're born of God. Now, unlike the sun and the moon and the stars, God doesn't change. He is changeless. And therefore, because he is changeless and because he is always sinless, his nature in us is always sinless. You see? Therefore, we don't have to keep giving birth to sin all the time because we've got a new nature and now we can produce holiness in our lives because we're born of God and because his nature is in us. And the reason he started off that section about being deceived is because the rest of this is him saying, look, you've got to judge and recognize the sin that you're coming up with from the old nature. That's got to be repented of, judged and dealt with. And only then, through the power of the word of God, are you going to start producing the holiness of God from the new nature. And in a few verses' time, we'll see him come back to the idea that it's the Word of God that enables us to do that. Okay. Now, look at verse 19 and you'll see the way that he, um, you know, sort of like develops this. He says, Know this, my beloved brethren, 
let every man be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Now, in effect, what he's saying, know this, my beloved brethren, because you've got a new nature, therefore, and of course what he's doing, is he's saying, this is the way it ought to be. It's not the way it is for you naturally, but you've got a new nature, so this is the way it ought to be, okay? And notice that here, in verse 19, he now introduces the subject of the mouth. And again, in verse 26, if anyone thinks he's religious and doesn't bridle his tongue, again, there you've got a mention of the mouth. Now, think of it like a symphony. Rather than reading a letter, we're listening to a symphony, okay? And of course, what you get on various subjects or themes in this symphony is you get a hint here, then a bit later on a definite introduction, like for instance in verse 20, you know, verse 19 hints, the tongue, then verse 26 is a definite introduction of this theme, it's not just a hint anymore, and then by the time we get to chapter 3, in a few studies time, you've got the thunderous climax and crescendo, and the theme is revealed in all its glory, and a whole chapter on the tongue. And can you see the idea of what James is doing here? He's introducing, hinting at, his themes. But all the themes are going to be developed later on. So like a symphony, there's a little, oh, little melody, I'll just pick that out there, all right? And then the music carries on, and then a bit later, oh, there's the melody again, but it's developed a bit. And then by the time you get to the end of the symphony, that melody is the very climax itself. And that is, in effect, what James is doing. So here, he's hinting now about the tongue. And he's saying, look, you've got a new nature, you're born of God, therefore, for instance, <laughs> it's going to affect the tongue, isn't it, lads? All right? And then he develops that really, you know, in detail later on, okay? So then, what he's saying now is, in the light of the fact that you've got a new nature, you're born of God, you don't have to just keep producing all the sin all the time, you know, you know, be holy, that's what he's saying. So, he says here, therefore, um, let every man be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. And again, we've got another you know, sort of like instruction here, a command. Now, we've got an equation, and this equation relates to us. He's saying, right, is this you, or is there some changing to do? And the equation is this. If you have quick to hear plus slow to speak, that equals slow to anger. You see? So quick to hear plus slow to speak equals slow to anger. Or, to put it the other way, therefore slow to hear plus quick to speak equals quick to anger. Now, can you see that equation? He's saying you should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and therefore slow to anger. But the problem with the sinful nature is that the sinful nature is, you know, is not that. It's slow to hear plus quick to speak equals quick to anger. Now, let's actually break this down, all right? Because this is a basic character trait that he's dealing with here. So, he's saying, let every man be quick to hear, or to listen, slow to speak, that's the mouth, and slow to anger. Now then, we'll break it down like this. What can be said of someone who is quick to hear and slow to speak? Because that's what we should be. We should be quick to hear and slow to speak. What can be said of someone who's like that? Well, if it's, for instance, that someone goes to such a person with a problem to be shared, then this person who's quick to hear and slow to speak, he's going to be concerned with this person's problem far more than he's concerned about himself. All right? So, what he wants to do, he wants to really listen to their problem, because he's only thinking about them. Sure, he's going to end up speaking, but only to help them. So what he wants to do first is to listen. 
because he's only thinking about that person. So, if you go with a problem to someone who is quick to hear but slow to speak, they're going to be concerned solely with you, aren't they? They're going to listen. Or secondly, say it's a discussion, all right? There's a discussion going on amongst people. Now then, if there's someone there who is quick to hear but slow to speak, then that means that they're humble enough to believe that they can actually learn something from that discussion. Their main concern isn't to just spout off what they know. They're listening to learn rather than being concerned with, oh, I've got to make sure they all know what I know. Now, what that tells us about a person like that is this. Selflessness plus humility equals a low probability of sinful anger. So, when James says, be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, what he's saying is, if we really live in a selflessness and a humility, concerning ourselves more with others than us, then there's a very low probability that we're going to be someone who gets angry. But, what can be said of the reverse now? What can we say about someone who's slow to hear, but quick to speak? What can we say about them? Well, if it's someone going to them with a problem, the person who is slow to hear, but quick to speak, he's not really concerned about that person. He's more concerned about how he's going to deal with their problem, how he's going to sort them out, isn't he? So, he's half listening to them, but really he's just now, what am I going to say? So he's not really listening to them, he's just thinking about what he's going to say to them, is he? Because his concern isn't them in their need, his concern is, oh, how am I going to sort this out? What am I going to say into these circumstances? So, therefore, a person goes to them with a problem, but they're not concerned about the person with the problem, they're just concerned about the wisdom they're going to speak into that situation, because they've got the wisdom to deal with it. You see, they're thinking of themselves. Or secondly, say if they're in a discussion, you know, and there's a group of people and they're talking and sharing about something, well, this person just thinks that everyone else ought to just shut up and listen to them and learn something. You see, that is the person who is quick to speak, but slow to hear. So therefore, what we've got there is we've seen that selflessness plus humility equals a low probability of sinful anger. But here, we've got self-obsession plus arrogance equals a high probability of sinful anger. Can you see? Because the anger or lack of it is a result of what goes before. To be quick to speak and slow to hear is the giveaway of a temperament that is prone to anger. But to be quick to hear and slow to speak is the sign of a temperament that is humble. And therefore, why should it get angry? Why should humility and selflessness end up sinfully angry. It's not going to happen, is it? Now, I've put that in the extreme, but there are shades of grey across the spectrum, and each one of us has got to know where we are. Because anger is very definitely a bad thing. Anger is not good. And so, therefore, when he introduces the idea of the tongue and speaking and anger, he says, the first thing to do is be quick to hear. Do more listening than you do talking. And if you take that approach, you'll end up being less angry. Now, that is really good common sense advice, isn't it? So, therefore, he's saying, anger shouldn't be part of our lives. The new nature should be overriding that. So, he's saying, therefore, start to act in this way, and then you'll find that the problem will start to go away because the new nature 
will start to take over. And you changing the way you act or behave is, as we're going to see, that step of faith that enables that new nature to actually come out. That is the step of faith that reckons ourselves to be dead to sin. Now then, he carries on, and he says, For the anger of man does not work the righteousness of God. And there is a straight, unarguable fact that the anger of man does not work the righteousness of God. Now, he's not talking here about righteous indignation. I mean, there is such a thing as that. I mean, Jesus got angry. That was righteous. That wasn't the anger of man, that was the anger of God. And there are times, if we follow the Lord, that we will experience the anger of God. But the anger of man is something entirely um, other than that. He's talking here, all right, about the anger of man. Now, if you experience the anger of God, <coughs> or righteous indignation, then that will produce fruit. Righteous indignation, it may well rebuke, but it will be in a very self-controlled manner, and it will be concerned only with God's honour and the greater good. So, to experience the anger of God is itself an entirely selfless thing, all right? But it's so easy, isn't it, when we try and call our sinful anger righteous indignation. No, that's not sinful anger, that was righteous indignation. I've actually, I've had Christians scream that at me in the past. You know, I've, I've, I've had people scream at me, I'm not angry with you, this is righteous indignation. And they are screaming, they are saying that at the top of their voice because they are so angry. All right. Now, that's, that's not on. The anger of man that James is talking about here is entirely a different thing and we all know what the anger of man is. I've just told you what the anger of God is, that it's a selfless thing, it's concerned only with the common good. But the anger that James is talking about here, and, and he says it, it, it should have, have no part um, in us, um, he, 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 you know, it, it's, it's when you want to get in there and really sort them out. I mean, the anger of man, it doesn't want to rebuke in the Lord for the blessing of that person. It wants to get in there and savage them. And it's not because of concern for God's honour, it's because they've got up your nose. Can you see the difference? So much of our anger, even when we're trying to say, well, really, it's righteous indignation, it's not. It's that someone has crossed us. Someone has done something we don't like, and so we get angry, all right? And, uh, you know, sort of like, there's nothing, there's nothing you could think that would be more enjoyable than blasting that person out. You see? That is the anger that James is writing about here, and he says, it will not do the work of God. Because it is pure, sinful nature. It's as simple as that. And it will never work righteousness. I mean, yeah, God will use everything for good in our lives. You know, I mean, if you decide to get angry with me and rip into me, well, I mean, you know, regardless of how you respond to that, God can use that for good in my life. But what we must never do is to look back and say, oh, in a situation like that, I was sinfully angry, somehow that did God's will. Because to be sinfully angry never does God's will. All it does is cut across everything that the God of all grace stands for. You know, so this wrong anger, which is, is, is so often you know, when people are very fast to talk and very slow to listen, the kind of anger that, that follows that scenario around, he's saying, no, you must stop that. That is not part of the Christian life. It's one of the things that has to go. It's as simple as that. Um, then, in verse 21, he goes on to say, therefore, you see, he's diving in with ethics here. This is what he's doing. He's diving in and he's saying, right, well, it means this for our behaviour, it means that. And it, it, in effect, it's one thing after another. He's saying, don't behave like that, behave like this. All right. So now he goes on, he says, therefore, put away all filthiness and rank growth of wickedness 
and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Now then, um, he talks about filthiness here. Put away all filthiness. That word is ruparia, and it, it means dirty. Um, in the Greek, a tramp's clothes are ruparia. And what he's saying here, quite simply, is it's to do with speaking. And it means that dirty jokes, toilet humour, sexual innuendo, all that is out. It, it's out. He's saying no. It's as simple as that. If we're Christians, we say no to that. Period. And then he talks about uh, rank growth of wickedness. Uh, rank growth here, perisaia, and it means a superabundance. And wickedness, this is kakia, and that's the Greek word for evil. Malicious or vicious. And so he's saying this is the problem. That we have a superabundance of this in our hearts. That is our very problem. And he's saying, put it away. It's as simple as that. You know, put a stop to it. So, here, we've got dirty talk. That's out. But with the rank growth of wickedness, there you've got malicious talk. Talk that is designed to hurt people. Talk that is designed to do them damage. Whether it's to their face or behind their back. Talk like that has got to go. Now, in the King James Version, this rank growth of wickedness is rather quaintly translated superfluity of naughtiness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think it's rather, you know, but that's, that, that is somehow too quaint. Because we're not talking about naughtiness here. It's a bad translation. I mean, naughtiness, kids are naughty. We're talking here about the evil of our hearts and the damage that the tongue can do. And he says, look, therefore, put it away. Put away. So, whether it's dirty talk, malicious talk, put it away. And this put away, all right, the Greek word there that he uses is apotathemi. And what it means is to put off from oneself. Now, if you go to um, Acts, Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 7, and I'll show you this word and it'll give you an idea of uh, the sort of thing it means. <coughs> Acts chapter 7, and verse 58. <coughs> and um, this is talking about the, um, the stoning of Stephen. And it says, Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And where you get laid down, that is this Greek word here. And what they did is because they were about to stone someone, you know, I mean, they had robes and jackets or whatever they wore. And so, in effect, what they did is they took some of their clothes off so that their arms were free, free to throw the stones. In effect, they partially undressed. And that's what the word means. It means to put off from yourself in the same way you would a jacket or a shirt or a skirt or something. Now, bearing that in mind, go to Ephesians <coughs> and keep tying this all together. Because in effect, what James is saying, because we're born of God, because we've got a new nature inside of us, yeah, sure, our sin nature always gives birth to sin. But he's saying it needn't be like that. We've got a new nature that will give birth to holiness. And he's saying this is how we act in order to bring that about. Now, in Ephesians 4 and verse 22, all right, and um, Paul writes this, he says, put off your old nature which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful lusts. He says, put it off, like a jacket that you don't want to wear anymore, put it off, it can be done. And he says, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on so you're taking one jacket off and you're putting another one on and put on the new nature created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, can you see what Paul is saying there? Only here, Paul's dealing more with the doctrine. James isn't concerned about that. He assumes they know the doctrine here. 
Paul is saying we can put off that old nature. We can become unresponsive to that old nature that only produces sin. And what we can do, because of what God has done in us, we can actually put on the new nature that is created after the likeness of God. And that new nature will produce holiness in exactly the same way that the old nature comes up with sin. And James is saying exactly the same as Paul. If you go to Colossians, we'll, we'll see a parallel you know, kind of passage where the thought is the same. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. And Paul says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you? Immorality, impurity, passion, evil, desire, covetousness, blah, blah, blah. Um, Go down to verse 7. In these you once walked when you lived in them, but now put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and foul talk from your mouth. Well, that's exactly what James has just covered, isn't it? Those very things. And he says, do not lie to each other, seeing that you have put off the old nature with its practices and have put on the new nature which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. So, there you have Paul saying exactly the same thing. He says, look, we've got a new nature. We can turn from the old one because the Holy Spirit is working because we've got a new life, we can be turning from that old nature and we can live more and more in the new nature. And that is exactly what James is saying here. You know, to put away, to put off yourself all filthiness, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Then he goes on to say, and receive with meekness the implanted word, because this is how we do it which is able to save your souls. Now then, this, this kind of receive with meekness, in the Greek, the idea of the word meek isn't weak. A lot of people think that meekness is weakness. You know, like the meek shall inherit the earth, if that's okay with the rest of you. <laughs> that's not what meekness is. The word in the Greek would be used to describe a stallion that has been broken in by its master. And it, it's the idea of controlled strength. So the strength of that stallion was once being used to buck off the man who was trying to break him. You get on the stallion and he uses all his strength to throw you off. But when the stallion's broken, it's still got the same strength, but now its strength is submitted to the one who's broken it. Can you see that? So meekness isn't weakness. What meekness is, is when we come to the Lord with all our faculties, all our strength, all our intelligence, the strength of our will. Christians shouldn't be weak-willed, we should be strong-willed, all right? And we come to God with all our strengths, blah, blah, blah. And what we do is we submit it to him and we say, Lord, you're in charge. That's what meekness is, all right? It's the willingness to be controlled by another, all right? So, he says, with meekness, because that's the attitude, it's the only attitude that's going to get us anywhere at all, willingness to be judged by the word of God. He says, with meekness, receive the implanted word. Implanted. Now, that word is emphutos in the Greek, and it's the metaphor of a seed rooting itself in the heart. All right? i.e. it's, um, you know, a gardening term, you know, you, you plant the seed and the, the flower grows. Now, can you see that is exactly what being born again is all about? He's back to being born. Can you see he's gone back now to his imagery of being born? Because, a, you know, a child or new life is born because a seed has been planted. Whether it's in the ground and you get a flower, or, you know, people, or foxes, or you name it. A seed has been implanted, a new life comes. And so this is what being born again is all about. It's a new nature implant. You know, I mean, in theory, if you swallowed a rose seed, and, you know, sort of like, you know, started off every day with a bowl of manure, in theory, you'd have roses coming out of your ears, wouldn't you? Because the plant would get inside you and it would grow. Now then, God has put a new nature in our hearts. The seed is planted, we have got a new nature implant. I mean, they do heart 
transplants, don't they? That's literally what we've had. A completely a seed of a totally new life has been put inside of us. And it's the very life and nature of Jesus himself. We've been born from above, like father, like son. Used to be Satan's child, used to be like him. Old nature still is, but we're born of God. God is our father. Our new nature is like him. So we've got a new nature implant, all right? And we must receive with meekness the implanted word. Now, the question here is, right, we've got a new nature, so how does it grow? This seed that's been planted, how does it grow? What is the food that will make my new nature grow, all right? And one answer we've got here, it's receiving the word of God. That is the food of the new na nature. That is how we will more and more leave the old behind and move into the new, the new nature that Jesus has granted to us. How does it grow? Receiving the word of God. Remember, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. They shall know the truth and the truth shall set them free. Jesus prayed, Father, sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. So that is how the new nature, that is the way into holiness, receiving the word of God. That is the food of the new nature God has given to us. And then it says, which is able to save your souls. Not talking here about being set free from, you know, sort of sin in the sense of we're not going to lake of fire. Souls, a soul is a dear old soul. Your soul is you. I mean, it's talking about there, this is what is going to deliver you and save you, set you free from the aforementioned sins. And what is it? It's receiving the word of God. With an open mind, humbly, and not fighting it all the way. That is the food of our new nature. So, we've got here stage one of growing in the Lord. And it's receiving and agreeing with God's word. So what he's saying here, you've got the new nature. Now, if you want to grow in it, if you want to know what it is to be getting free from the power of sin in your life, then you've got to feed that new nature. And stage one is that you receive the word of God. That is the first stage. You've got to take in the word of God You've got to agree with God's word. That is stage one. But now, in verse 22, the next verse, he moves on to stage two. Look what he says. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And what was it we started off with? Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. So, so now, there are two ways we can get deceived about ourselves. We can certainly do it by staying away from the Word of God. Oh boy, we'll end up deceived about ourselves then. But there's another way we can deceive ourselves, and do you know what it is? It's by going to Bible studies, but just not doing what we learn the Bible says. That's the other way to get deceived. So, what we're seeing now is that in order to grow in the Lord, receiving the word of God is vital, but it's not enough. Agreeing with the word of God is vital, but it's not enough. Hearing God's word, receiving it, agreeing with it, believing it, that's great, stage one. But if you stop there, it'll get you nowhere. Absolutely nowhere. In fact, it's dangerous. Because if you stop there, you'll just become self-righteous. And you'll be deceived. The second stage that completes the circuit, and without this second stage, the current will not flow. It's as simple as that. We kid ourselves if we think it's, it will. The second stage is, yeah, we receive it and agree with it, stage one, but then it's got to be acted on and put into practice. Now that is what completes the circuit. The teaching of the Bible that we receive through our own reading of it, through coming to Bible study, 
through listening to tapes, through reading books, all that is vital, okay? We must be doing that. But what we're learning, we must then make sure that it changes us, you see? No use learning new truth, but we got to walk in the new truth that we've learned. So therefore, he's saying, be doers of the word, not hearers only. And it is so e easy to, to just be a hearer. But he says, if that's the truth about you, he says, you may well be sitting there thinking, oh, I've got such a knowledge of the Bible, this is wonderful. But he says, if that's all you've got, a knowledge of the Bible, and you're not doing it, he says, then you are deceiving yourself. You might think you're a wonderful believer with a really good understanding of God's Word, but he says the truth is you are deceiving. Your heart is deceiving you. If we think that receiving God's Word and knowing God's Word is enough, we're actually kidding ourselves. It's got to be obeyed, i.e. the Word of God must all the time be changing the way we behave. This is what the letter of James is all about. Let's go on. Verse 23, he says, look, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who observes his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself and goes away and at once forgets what he looks like. Now then, you can look in the mirror for two reasons. And uh, I know one of the reasons, you know, the reason he's not referring to here. <laughs> if you want to look in the mirror to, to admire yourself all day, fine. I suppose mirrors will do that. You know, we can admire ourselves in a mirror. But that is not the way a holy person uses a mirror. <laughs> a holy person uses a mirror to make sure that they are presentable. Yep. So, the point is, Someone now, they're a hearer of God's Word, they go to the Bible studies, they receive God's Word, all right, what they like, yeah, but, but they don't do it, they don't do it, what are they like? Well, they look in the mirror, all right, and uh, they're receiving God's Word, there's the reflection, and of course, God's Word reveals the truth about us, all right, so they look in the mirror, and yeah, they need a shave, and uh, got to do something about those spots on the end of the nose, and goodness, my hair is sticking up, there's grease running off it. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. I've got a bit of work to do here. <laughs> you know? Sort of whiskers, spots, hair, grease. You know? <laughs> so then, he goes away from the mirror. Do you know what he does then? He goes out. Goes out. Doesn't burst the spots. Doesn't shave. Doesn't wash his hair. Doesn't, you know? And... James says, if you simply hear the word of God, then that's what you're like. I.e., the word of God as you receive it shows you the mess you're in, the things that need to be put right. So put them right. But if you don't, well, I mean, who's ultimately the loser who goes away having forgotten what they look like in the mirror. So I think, oh dear, oh dear, he needs a bit of work done on his face, doesn't he? They are walking around thinking, oh, aren't I handsome, aren't I handsome, and your hair's sticking up, and oh dear, oh dear. Now, that is what we're like when we receive the Word of God, but we don't act on it. It shows us what a mess we are, and then we go away and we continue being a total mess. The idea is that we're supposed to work to, to change, uh, you know, to, to bring about that which, which God's Word shows us needs to be corrected, that's what we need to correct. But it's so easy, isn't it, to just he hear God's Word, to just, you know, receive it and not do anything about it. Now, in verse 25, but he goes on to say, but he who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer but forgets, but a doer that acts, he shall be blessed in his doing. Now, f first of all, there, there's James talking about the perfect law of liberty. He's not talking about the Mosaic law anymore, is he? You see, here we see James delivered from the error of the legalism that he was in, that we saw in regards to the introduction, all right? So here, what's he saying? Look, you know, he, he, he's saying kind of, look, but there's, 
there's got to be perseverance. I mean, he's not, you know, sort of saying that, you know, right, okay, the word of God reveals a sin, right, okay, in five minutes' time that sin is dealt with, gone full time. He's not saying that. He says you look into the law of liberty and then you have to persevere. You see, persevere. It's not a once and for all thing, you know, I mean, even as we, we let the word of God judge us, that changing can be a process. We've got to persevere. It's not necessarily going to happen overnight in regards to everything, all right? But what he does say, he says, look, as long as we're a doer that acts, no use being a hearer who forgets, but as long as we're a doer that acts, okay, it may take time. We might have many failures before we find success in various areas of life. But we're persevering. We're doing it. We're going for it in faith, we're looking to the Lord, then you see he says, he shall be blessed in his doing. You see? So the point is, God will meet us. If we're doing it, God will provide the power, God will provide the grace. It'll take time. But my goodness, what a tragedy. Wouldn't it be daft to just be people who are all the time growing in their knowledge and understanding of God's word, but not in actually being changed in the way that the Word of God and the Lord himself is actually trying to change us. Okay. Now then, verse 26 and 27, and you remember last time I said these, these verses kind of, they sum up really the, the whole thing that James is about. Practical Christianity. You're a Christian? Show me. That's what he's saying. You're saved? Act saved. Let me see it. Let me see your salvation in the way you act, okay? Now then, it's back to the tongue here. We've had a hint. Now the theme is introduced. The crescendo won't come till chapter 3. But nevertheless, he says, If anyone thinks he's religious and doesn't bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, there you've got it again. See, deceiving ourselves. Oh, I'm spiritual. I do this, I do that, I do the other. Is the tongue bridled? It's not bridled, we're deceiving ourselves. He says, this man's religion is vain. So, there you have it, he's back to the uncontrolled tongue. Now then, does it mean that somehow we've got to make sure our tongues are perfectly controlled by tomorrow morning, or by next week's Bible study, and I'm going to check up? <laughs> no! We're going to have to persevere. But my goodness, we've got to make sure that we are submitting our tongues to the Lord. Can you see, that we're working on it. Doesn't mean we're going to hit perfection overnight, or anything like that. But it's so easy, isn't it, to, you know, just sort of carry on with an unbridled tongue. You know, whatever our mouth wants to say, that's okay with us, all right? And, and then to think that we're getting somewhere with the Lord. We're not. We're not. Our religion, our following the Lord, is in vain. So then, Christians who have got the talk, but haven't got the do, and there are lots of Christians, they've got the talk, but they haven't got the do, have they? Well, it is totally useless. I mean, we might be like that, and we might impress ourselves, and we might even get away with impressing others. But the Lord looks on the heart, and, and it really is totally and utterly useless. And then he goes on to say, look, religion that is pure and undefiled. He said, look, if we're really going to get down to bar brass tacks, all right? You want to you wanna know if you're following the Lord? Okay, this is what following the Lord is all about. He says, religion that is pure and undefiled before God and the Father is this. <coughs> to visit orphans and widows, they're the people in need, with no one to look after them, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. And there you have the brass tax. There you have genuine discipleship defined by the Word of God. Is it out on the streets preaching the gospel and leading people to Jesus? No, it isn't. But that's part of it. That's part of it. We're not saying don't do that. Of course we're not. That's brilliant. But you can do that without being a genuine disciple, you see, because you'd have the gift of the gap. Um, is, it, is it kind of um, laying hands on the sick and seeing them healed? Is that genuine discipleship? Well, mm, I say nothing against it. It's part of genuine discipleship, but you can do that without being a genuine disciple. 
in 1 Corinthians 13. Paul says, look, you can have all the gifts of the Spirit and no love. And you're a clanging gong, a noisy symbol. It's pointless. So, things like that are not in themselves. You pray all day. Yeah, you, you could pray all day, like the Pharisees used to do. And I say nothing against prayer. Disciples will pray. But it's not prayer that makes a disciple. Do you see what I mean? What makes a disciple is caring for those in need. So, in the widest possible sense, we put their giving. And I say in the widest. It's not just a financial thing, but it is that. But the giving of time, the giving of energy, making myself available for others and whatever they need. So, real servant stuff serving our brothers and sisters and serving those who are in need in any way at all, okay, whom we can help. Obviously, you can't help everyone in need, but those whom you can. So that's the first thing, caring for those who are in need, being a servant to the world. And then secondly, keeping oneself unstained from the world, sanctification, practical holiness, the very thing that he's talking about here. And thus far, we've seen things like, you know, sort of like a cut the dirty jokes out. Um, the nasty use of the mouth. No, cut it out. And you see, that's the sort of area that he's been covering so far. As we go through this, we're going to find that he covers other things as well. But this is the real brass tacks. That is the test of whether or not we are really following the Lord serving others, because if we have the Lord first, if we bow down to him, if we submit to him, if we say, Lord, I am going to serve you, all right, then what we're saying is, Lord, your work, I'm here willing to do it. I want to serve you. Now then, what is God's work? It's serving people, because the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. So therefore, for me to serve God, to do his work, what's the work he wants me to do? His work is serving others. So that's going to be my work if I'm a disciple. And if someone isn't serving others, well, whatever spirit might be coming out of them at any one time, it's not what the Bible calls the spirit of Christ, is it? Because Jesus came as a servant. So there's the first test. And the second test that goes with it, because after all, one could really be into serving people, because, you know, I mean, you always get these kind of, I call them the Greenpeace type people, but I mean, I know that's a bit unfair to Greenpeace, but you know what I mean. You know, sort of like always wanting to do social good works. So They're kind of the natural social workers. There are people like that, okay? So, you know, and they might not even be Christians. But the other thing is personal holiness being delivered from the power of sin in my life day by day. And it's those two things together that are the actual test of whether or not we are disciples. Whether or not we are not born again, because you can be born again and not be a disciple. I mean, that's why he's writing this letter, because you can be born again and not be a disciple. I mean, that's why the letters in the New Testament were written. Because we can be born again and not be a disciple. We can be a carnal Christian as opposed to what the Bible would call a spiritual Christian. And James is saying, this is the test and this is what you've got to measure yourself by. And as we're going to start seeing next time when we come on to chapter 2 and through the rest of the letter, that in effect the rest of the letter are these two verses opened out just applied to all various different areas of life. And that so far, in the two studies we've done on chapter 1, we've seen his index. We've seen all the areas that he's going to touch on, but he's skipped around all over the place. But as we go through, we're going to see them all developed in more detail and applied uh, quite mercilessly. And, uh, you know, we're certainly, you know, we are going to see in the letter of James teaching applied quite mercilessly. I mean, he's quite a character. But nevertheless, the Lord is quite merciless on our sin. He's exceedingly merciful on us. Of course he is. But the spirit wars against the flesh. God is at war with the power of sin in our lives. And he wants to set us free from it. Therefore, he is prepared to be merciless at times, as we're going to see in the rest of this letter. So, 
we will carry on with chapter two next time.